last episode, we showed you all how we got the smelter tank set up so that we could do a pour. However, before we can actually use that to pour the 10,000 pounds of lead, we needed to get the mold made for the lead keel. That means making the plug that'll give us the shape in the concrete mold. Yeah. Lawson's looking pretty sad right now. It's looking really sad. The red pencil did not like the sun, we believe. It's pretty much gone. And that is the profile view. Mm -hmm. So we gotta go through and redraw that, which shouldn't be too hard to do. Yeah. <clears throat> Have to go back over to find the screw holes. Yep. So. And then I think everything else is pretty much there. Once we get the profile drawn back in, we got to finish it, figuring out the bottoms of the mold. So those need a little tweaking. We get that done, we can draw in the lead ballast keel as opposed to the iron ballast keel. Mm -hmm. And then we should be done with lofting. Cool. That would be good. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think that'll take too long. Yeah. Then we can start working on the ballast keel mold. Yeah. But even before we can make the plug, we need to find the shape of the keel, which means that we have to loft the plants with the lead keel. Cool. All right, well, let's right. clean this off and draw some lines. Let's do it. Let's do it. Looks like we only have one thing of red left. You ready? We're going shopping on a Saturday. It's 11.30. Terrible idea. This is going to be <laughs> our version of hell. Oh my god. Yeah. Well, we need those sharpies. Let's do it. Well, hopefully the sharpie lasts longer. Sure. Yeah, that was much cheaper too. While we were out running errands, we decided to stop at Home Depot and check out some of the power tools. We had plans to go pick up a large drill that we had seen on Craigslist, which we would use to drill the holes for the keel bolts. We also wanted to buy a grinder since it has been useful throughout the build so far. Alright, we survived our shopping experience. Woo! -wee. Wow. <laughs> that was enough humanity for me for the day. So, celebrating with a little coconut water. <laughs> Back home, we started retracing the lines on our lofting floor. More okay. errands. <laughs> Second time to Amherst today. Second time to Amherst. One more to go later today. <laughs> but we're getting what we need. Yeah, I just went and picked up a really big, heavy, old, slow drill. Yeah, that thing's much sweet. needed. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. could see the torque when you turn it on. You're like, Whoa. yeah, it's like 350 <laughs> RPM, I think. Which is what we need. Yeah, yeah. So for drilling the keel bolts and the bigger stuff for the backbone, it's going to be really, really nice. They don't really make them like that anymore. All metal, I think, probably weighs 20 pounds. Yeah. With everything redrawn, it was time to tackle lofting the lead keel. So, we drew everything in pencil, and it lasted pretty well. And then the red faded, but the blue more or less stayed. So we decided that we wanted to be a bit more permanent since we got the lines more ironed out. So we bought Sharpies, these thin ones. And we drew them in with Sharpie and it was great. The lines, you could see them super well. And that was what, a week ago? Yeah. That's it. And from being out in the sun, they're gone. So there used to be big, bright Sharpie lines. I can just barely follow them. So it took us, I don't know, an entire day, maybe more, to go through and redraw all the lines. And a week later, they're gone. So now, before we can loft the ballast keel, we need to go through and mark all these points and redraw them for a third time now. Yep. So we need to get something to cover the lofting floor so that the sun stops eating our marks away. And that is definitely the lesson that we have learned. So colored pencil lasts longer than Sharpie, uh, although it rubs off and is a little harder to see. And the Sharpie lasts about a week when it's bright out. So, yeah, lesson learned. So we ended up redrawing the lines again. This time we'll be covering the lofting floor. Time to get set up to work. There are many aspects of the preparation for this project that many people don't get to see. And we thought you might enjoy seeing this little side project that will definitely help us later on.
So there's not a great place to store all of the tools out here. And there's a lot of different tools that we need throughout the build. So I took my great great grandfather's tool chest here and put it on a cart with some old bicycle tires. And I have a large percentage of the hand tools that we need during the build all stored in here. So we can wheel it around depending on where we're working and we can lock it up safe and sound in the garage at night. So in the top here, I've got my bag with all of our impact drivers, their chargers, and their batteries. So you can pop that out. And I set that on the drill bit drawer because in the very bottom, I have all the hand plans set up. And I really don't want to mess up all the hand plans by putting the bag of the drills on top of them. You know, they would be sitting on the irons and stuff. And then same thing, I don't really want them sitting on top of my spoke shaves or my draw knife. But the bag's not really going to hurt anything in the drill bit drawer. And then this one isn't done yet. It's just kind of roughed out. But these are where all the chisels and the gouges are going to go. And then we have a bunch of measuring and marking and levels, razor blades, string, plumb bobs. And on the very top, we have all of our calipers, bevel gauges, scale rule, as well as all the Sharpies we've been using. So everything fits pretty snug. And then in the back, I put some PVC pipe where we can stick the squares, the hammers, some more measuring, and then the saws go on the very end. It should make for much fewer trips between here and the wood shop. All right, now let's show you how we started making the plug for the mold. First, you need to make templates of all the shapes that you drew out in the lofting floor. And now, some of you might be wondering how you do that. Well, let's see, this is how. You need a way to transfer the design from the lofting floor onto your plywood. Now, how do we do that, you might ask? Well, that's what these nails are for. You place the nail heads in the lines that you're using, and then you imprint those nail heads into the plywood that you're using, and connect the dots, just like you would as a kid. First you start by placing roofing nails head side into the line. Once you've done this across all the lines that you need, you place your plywood over those nails. Make sure that you're covering the entire design. And then, you just walk on it. The printing dance. <laughs> this will imprint the nail heads into your plywood and leave you some divots that you can find afterwards. So, there's one, there's one, there's one. So that's gonna go down. I'm gonna head out this way. So there's one. There's one. There's one. There's one. And there's one. And there's one. Because this should be a straight line. That'll be easy. And then that'll be a straight line down 90. And then it's just going to be connecting those and that, and then springing our points for the curve. Cool. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, bring this over and put it on the workbench. Here we are, the final shapes. The side of the ballast keel, that's the shape. So station five, station six, station seven, and station eight in the very tail. Yeah. And then we're gonna make 
uh, mold that stands up at each of these stations that's the shape of it and that's what I have drawn out here. So this line is the top of the iron or the top of the ballast keel and then this line down here is the bottom of the ballast keel and this red line is the center. So if you connect the outer two lines this is what Atkins gives us for points. It's not long enough, but kind of gives you the idea. So there's the shape of our casting. Now in the drawing... This is a pretty square shape. Right? Yeah, pretty square shape. In the drawing, this down here is curved, which means we either need to kind of take some width out of the bottom of the ballast keel, or we need to add some to the width over here so we can get that roundness. Does that make sense? Yeah, it looks like taking it out might be a better shape. Or just leaving that line straight and just rounding it out. Kind of rounding the corner. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I came and got you. So I wasn't <laughs> sure. It's pretty much what, what we, we needed to look like is this, right? Yeah, so right here we're looking at station five. So top of the ballast casting, bottom of the ballast casting. That's that side. And then that's that little corner that we gotta figure out. And we gotta figure that out for five, six, and seven. And they're all a little different. Six and seven are the same width at the top and width at the bottom, but as you can see, six is a little shorter than seven, and five is both narrower and shorter at the top and the bottom. So one curve probably isn't gonna work very well for all of them, so. Right on, well. Now we, now we play. Let's try and figure it out. <laughs> Station seven, station five. <laughs> His bond's not even flat at all. So, there's the other thing. But this is sort of a station six, which is between five and seven. Yeah. So it goes, and you have to look at that here, round, flat, round. So we're going round to where yeah, we're at our deepest. Weird. That doesn't make any sense. No. So say we do something, I know this is straight, yeah. but Imagine we do something along those lines and you take one of these ingots <laughs> off of each side down the entire length of that. Yeah. I mean, you're talking removing a thousand pounds or adding a thousand pounds of ballast or more. Yeah. So that's... But it looks like that's what he's got figured out. But that's just a guessing game but, at that point. But in this picture, it's flat. Like you yeah. said, there's like... There's still a significant flat there. Even yeah. if it's not the full ton, there's, he's, he's representing a flat in that drawing. But this was also drawn after as an addendum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, is the steel, I mean, the iron keel built differently than the lead keel? It might be shaped differently. The so, iron keel might be rounder so that it has more... I don't know. Maybe they're trying to reduce the weight on the iron keel because it's so much longer and it's a full keel anyways. Yeah. And the there lead might they're be. trying to condense it. I don't know. I personally would go according to this mm -hmm. without looking at those because those were drawn for the iron. For the iron. But then why not just keep the shape of the iron and make it a little <laughs> bit longer for the lead? It's a very excellent question. And if you're worried about the strength of the lead, Maybe a the narrower, taller piece of lead is going to be more rigid than a shallower, flatter piece of lead. Yeah. So, I mean, we can the go, we can go logic can, all day. The only thing I can think of is that it would be easier for him to figure out the weight of the iron keel for a squarer piece than it would be for something with lots of rounded edges. And so, as an addendum, it would have probably been easier for him to have Just something to put a that's square more chunk of lead square. Under the yeah. So this is why we keep saying we're building an Akin S boat. <laughs> oh. Well, my favorite for that is. The water line on the plan say it's 30 feet, but when you draw them out, it's 32. So either all the other measurements work and that one is off, we somehow can't measure that one right, or the red is wrong. So do we build the boat as we see it or as they describe it? I don't know. I say we build it as we see so it. We <laughs>
Yeah. So you're thinking just leave them flat and nip the corners? I think that's the best course of action. Okay. Well, we'll go with it. We'll find out what happens. <laughs> and I'm leaving us two and a half extra inches in the height. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm like 80% sure that the mold's gonna swallow all 10,000 pounds, even if we nip the corners, because yeah. of that extra height over the whole top that makes up a lot more. Yeah, that'll corners. make up more than if we just like nipped off the wrong corners. You know what I mean? So like if we nip off a thousand pounds off the sides accidentally, but we have an extra inch that we gave ourselves in height, we'll add that extra thousand pounds, you know, in space, no problem. Yeah. So ultimately, I think the mold will be big enough and yeah yeah and if not well we'll just i guess stack more lead ingots in the build which kind of sucks but it's not a bad worst case scenario yeah i feel pretty good about this though personally just, i mean really for first timers it's a lot of guesswork it is a lot of guesswork which is you know kind of cool like we're we're building our boat yeah. <laughs> for better or for worse at this point there are several different ways that you can do this many people choose to layer boards and make a single block out of them and then shape that entire block into the shape of their keel. What we decided to do and thought it would be much cheaper would be to build the mold out of the shapes that we've printed. We're then going to build it out with rigid foam that we salvaged and shape that to the final dimensions of our keel. Once that was done, we would cover it in fiberglass and we'd have a solid structure. Now, that didn't happen as planned. We used light board to build out the sides that were going to be straight anyways. In the space that was going to be curved, we still planned on packing in the rigid foam and shaping it. Once it was in though, we had another idea. Shoot our fans. lumps should just fare out. It's a nice thing with the lead, it's soft enough, we can just take the power planer and shave it right down. The last step was the fiberglass and resin to give it rigidity and to keep the cement from pouring into the seams. Now, this was by far the most frustrating part of this. Neither Steve nor I enjoy working with fiberglass, nor resin for that matter. We dislike the noxious fumes, we dislike the itch of the fiberglass, so props to anybody who can work with this stuff. We admire you. Though, we prefer the idea of keeping this as far away from our project as possible. This is super precise. For quarter can of resin, use quarter tube of hardener. Oh, see what happens. Probably due to user error, we had a lot of bumps and bubbles in our fiberglass, which we ended up just sanding down and kind of covering up in order to avoid major deviations from the actual shape of the keel, which we would then have to fare out later on. Finally, once the plug is done, you have to put it into a container which will hold the cement, which will then harden around the plug, and once you take the plug out, you'll have a hole left that is the shape of your keel, which you then pour the lead into. But we'll leave that for a future episode. 